All right, great. Uh, firstly, thank you once again um, for the opportunity to speak and to, to meet with you. Uh, I'm always very grateful to be able to um, hang out with your congregation at Greater Dandenong uh, and to bring you the word. Um, I thought today I'd bring you a word from uh, one of the parables, no, not, not a parable, sorry, one of the accounts um, in, in Jesus's ministry that really spoke to me. Uh, it really spoke to me because uh, it spoke much to my faith journey. Uh, and I hope it speaks to yours as well. All right. Um, so you probably recognize that term, which is the title of today's message, Help My Unbelief. Uh, and if you do recognize it, it comes from... Um, the account where it's with Jesus healing the boy with an unclean clean spirit. So I'm going to go through some verses uh, in the Bible. So I'll get you to read along with me. Uh, this is in Mark 9, 14 to 29. And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out and they were not able. And he answered them, O oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy. And he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood, and it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible, one who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out. And the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, He's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he rose. And when they had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. So a little context. Mark records this event as um, just after the transfiguration. All right. So when Jesus took Peter, James, John, uh, up onto a mountain to witness Elijah and Moses being transfigured with Jesus himself. So coming down from the mountain, they should have been on a spiritual high, on fire. Yet this account finds the disciples confounded by their own inability to heal a boy of his unclean spirit. Quite a stark contrast, right? So that, the, the first thing that we notice is that an argument breaks out. The focus of the argument was that uh, around why the disciples couldn't perform a healing, which they were meant to be able to, because they've done it before. They've done lots of other healings. What a stark contrast to the moment experienced by Jesus, Peter, James, and John moments ago. From a moment of great encouragement, 
to one of great discouragement. This would explain Jesus' lament. All right, so if I break this down a little bit, that where Jesus says, Oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? You know, what exactly do you think Jesus expected from the people? It seemed, it seems that he was disappointed at their lack of faith, that they should have had greater faith in him than they do. Then we also see, um, what was interesting is the request by the father. Because, you know, here's a man who woke up that morning deciding with a desperate plan, one where he would put his faith in the disciples of Jesus to heal his son. You know, his son has been through this since childhood. However, after bringing his son to them for healing, his faith was rewarded by this appointment. The disciples may have been able to heal many other men, women, children, but not his son. When Jesus, when Jesus then asked the father about his son's condition, the father pleaded with him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. He was desperate and unsure, you know, uh, and Okay, if we were honest with our own faiths, quite often we, we find ourselves in the same situation where we're still unsure. That morning when the father decided to bring his son for healing, I'm sure his words would have been, please heal my son. Instead of, if you can do anything, have compassion on us. But now his words were different. And then look at Jesus' response. If you can, all things are possible for one who believes. It was a rebuke. It was a rebuke for his lack of faith. But a reflection, what do you think of the father's faith? Has he got good reason to doubt? It would seem that he does because this didn't work out like he'd originally thought. Jesus' disciples didn't exactly deliver what this man expected them to deliver. And quite often in our lives, this is where doubt comes in because we ask of God something which he doesn't deliver to our expectations. We have expectations. We make requests. We pray but God answers it sometimes in a very different way to what we originally thought. And sometimes that throws doubt in our minds. Doubt that our prayers work. Doubt that our faith is working. Doubt for many reasons. And alas, what is most touching about the Father's plea in response is this acknowledgement of his lack of faith. He says, I believe, please help my unbelief. See, I believe that this illustrates how unbelief can coexist with belief. In fact, unbelief is part of our imperfect faith. And it's unlikely to le ever leave us until we see Jesus face to face. So if unbelief is part of our imperfect faith, the question is, how do we ensure that our unbelief doesn't turn into disbelief, which is really the erosion of our faith? All right, so... The father's response is such a lesson, I think. You know, our faith, yeah. at least I find mine, travels between the fine line of faith and doubt. This means that it is always either increasing or decreasing. 
right? Um, and our doubts will never let our faith increase without concerted effort, without work. If we understand that our faith is imperfect and, and has doubts, contains doubts, what should we do as Christians? How do we plead like the Father in this account? How do we allow Jesus to work on our unbelief? Now, I think the, the first point I want to make is that the Father in this account acknowledged first his belief and also that he has unbelief. He has doubts and he's seeking help with those doubts. And now, uh, you know, in, in Hebrews 11.1, 1, you know, the definitive now verse about faith in itself. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen, right? It talks to the fact that faith is about some, a conviction about something that you don't know for certain. You absolutely don't know for certain. There's no absolute concrete way that you will know that you have faith. And that's where faith can coexist with doubt. Um, we've been studying the book of John in our uh, midweek Bible class. And uh, one of the accounts we recently looked at was in John 11. It's a great account of Jesus raising Lazarus. And Jesus had been told that Lazarus was sick before he died. And Jesus actually had the opportunity to get to heal Lazarus before he died. But Jesus stayed back and delayed his approach to Bethany because he wanted to give glory to God through what would happen in his arrival. And this, and uh, what's interesting about this account is that both Mary and Martha, if you remember Mary and Martha, what are they best known for? Quite often, if you say Mary and Martha, Together, you know, one was sitting at the feet of Jesus and the other was working in the kitchen. All right. And quite often, I don't know about you, but in Christian circles, if someone's complaining about doing too much for Christ, you say, don't be a Martha. All right. So don't be a Martha. Uh, a Martha had, you know, poor thing. It's got a bit of a reputation. Um, but in this account, both Mary and Martha came up to Jesus and said, if you had been here, if you had not delayed and you had come here earlier, our brother Lazarus would still be alive. It is their brother that died. And they know that had Jesus come earlier before he'd passed away, that he would have been able to heal Lazarus. But at this time, He's passed away, he's died, so there's nothing more to be done except to mourn. But here's Jesus in this account in John 11. He's, he says, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you? that if you believed, you would see the glory of God. So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice. 
Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound, with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to him, unbind him and let him go. See, what's interesting about this account is Jesus' words to Martha. You know, Martha was all like logical, right? It's like, if we, un- if we roll away the stone to the tomb, it's going to smell bad. It's going to smell bad because he's been dead. He's been dead for four days. Don't do it. Whatever you think you're going to do, Jesus, don't go see Lazarus because he's already dead. But Jesus said to her in this account, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Now, what does that say about believing and seeing? Doesn't the saying go, seeing is believing? We see, we'll believe. But what Jesus is saying is that, well, if you believe, you would see the glory of God. It's quite the opposite, right? So um, belief precedes uh, seeing. So if you believe, if you choose to believe, and belief is the choice, you would see, you would see the glory of God. And that's uh, where our faith comes into play. Here's another account um, of faith demonstrated um, and it's it's uh we won't be strangers to this it's where jesus walks on water in matthew 14 immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds and after he had dismissed the crowds he went up on the mountain by himself to pray when evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way away from land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. In the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come out to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat and the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. And this account of Jesus walking on water often focuses on Peter asking to walk on the water towards Jesus and then sinking. Peter was so full of faith. And he was able and willing to ask Jesus to allow him to walk on water. I don't know about you, but I'm not sure I would have made that request, right? Um, But Peter certainly does. He sees Jesus walking on water and he, he has the faith to ask Jesus that he may do the same. The only time he started to sink was when he saw the wind and believed his senses over his faith. Let the strength and the might of the wind was greater than Jesus's. That's when he began to feel afraid and allow his unbelief to outweigh his faith. See, prior to getting on the boat, the disciples had just witnessed Jesus feeding 5,000 with two fish and five loaves. All right, the disciples 
should have been full of faith. But only Peter, only Peter asked Jesus to allow him to step out in faith on the border. None of the other disciples did. All right. The disciples should have been full of faith. But only Peter asked. And as he pleaded with Jesus to save him, Jesus rebuked Peter. Oh, you of little faith. Yet to be fair to Peter, it took Peter a great deal of faith just to be able to step out of that boat. He had faith, but he let doubt get the better of him. The problem is with uh, unbelief is that if left alone, it will achieve its one purpose, that is to destroy or to make one's faith lukewarm. You know, we live in a, a modern world that is walking away from God faster than we've ever seen. And in some places, it's running away from God. The opposite direction. We live in a sensuous world that leans heavily on the five senses. It encourages us to indulge in our own wants and needs over and above those of our brothers and sisters. Uh, it pursues things of this life like there is nothing else after death. You know, if Peter who was known to be full of faith, was able to let his senses rule his unbelief. How do you think we will fear on our own? Um, and, and my absolute, uh, one of my favorite parables, and I referred it to the last time uh, I spoke with you, is the parable of the, the sower. I'm going to jump into it. Uh, before we, we round back to um, the healing of the boy with an unclean spirit. Uh, the reason why I don't want to read this is because um, the, there's a certain illustration in, in the parable of the sower. Uh, so if you have your Bibles with you, turn to Matthew 13. Because I don't have it on screen. Matthew 13, 3 to 9, and then 18 to 23. A sower went out to sow, uh, and he told them in many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell among, along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. And then uh, verse 18 is where the explanation comes in. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches it away, snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, Immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields. In one case, a hundredfold and another 60 and another 30. But when you read the explanation of the different soil types, 
which do you think applies to you? Which soil do you think you are? If you've had a moment to think about it, I don't know about you, but I almost always think I'm the good soil. <laughs> the good soil applies to me. <laughs> But I recently read a book that challenges that and states, do not assume that you are the good soil. Now, that was a bit of a shock to me, I must admit, because I've not considered the alternatives, right? But the Bible is quite clear about how difficult it is to be the good soil. In fact, in Matthew 7, 13 to 14, Jesus says, enter by the narrow gate for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction and those who enter it by it are many for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few you know, there's almost a guarantee in the words of jesus that you know if you are in the majority you are most likely in the wide gate, not the narrow. A little further in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, Jesus once again reminds his disciples that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, on that day, Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? You know what this is saying, what Jesus is saying? That there are some followers of Jesus who call him Lord, who may not be known to him. Those who have taught in his name, and have done works in his name. You know, that includes you. That includes me. There is a chance that we may not be the good soil that we think we are. I know, isn't that scary? Isn't that depressing? Now, this does not mean that we do not have hope. We do absolutely have hope. We have a great hope that if we are willing to surrender all ourselves to Jesus, to choose the narrow way. And by what the parable shows us, this narrow way is not the way that most people choose. I say this because whether I'm the rocky ground or the thorny ground, by the grace of God, I may still become the good soil. But until I acknowledge that I am in need to help uh, I'm in need of help to change my current position. I will continue to assume incorrectly that I'm indeed the good soil. So back to the story of the father with uh, father of the boy with the unclean spirit. It was only when the father acknowledged to Jesus that he needed help with his unbelief, that Jesus was able to help him. And I believe that by the grace of Jesus, when the father asked for Jesus to help his unbelief, he was given a new soil type. All right. In closing, I wanted to read from Revelations uh, 3, 14 to 20. It is important for us to realize that each of us needs to acknowledge our unbelief and seek help from Jesus to lift us up. If we do nothing, our faith will not mature and our unbelief will take its toll upon us. 
So Revelation 3, 14 to 20, all right, uh, the church, to the church in Laodicea, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich. I have prospered. I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see those whom I love. I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write the words of the Amen, the faithful, true witness, the beginning of God's creation. You know, uh, every time I read that letter to the church of Laodicea, it is always, I shift uncomfortably in my seat, put it that way. Because I know at some level, my faith um, with its unbelief matter just to make me lukewarm. And, but you know what the good news is that Jesus tells us even those who have become lukewarm in their faith, those who have let their unbelief overcome them are able to repent and once again be zealous. For Jesus is standing at the door and knocking. Our job is to open that door. That's not to say that your faith is in the shape, same shape as someone else's. No, are we to judge, but judge for yourselves, your the own state state of your own faith. I want to pray that uh, God continue to bless you as you live out your faith, maintaining an assurance of your hope in Jesus Christ and a conviction of his, his unseen promises. God bless you.